And I see the freelance part-time labor as putting the control back in the employer. They've decided that these are the amount of hours you're going to work for me, but it doesn't really shift the narrative. Full-time work was 40 hours, part-time work is 20 hours, but it's defined by the employer. You start to look at fractional, starts to move the conversation more towards the employee. And the employee is saying, I'm dedicated to you. However, I'm not dedicated to you 100% of the time. Time to me is another control mechanism. How many widgets can you pump out in an hour? You can start mm. to slice and dice that and determine that the average employee can pump out X amount of widgets. Everybody's held to that certain benchmark and then will they exceed or under exceed? And then you can write performance management against that. Technology has afforded individuals to create 10X the amount of widgets in the same amount of time. Now those tools are evenly distributed, but some will take advantage, some will not take advantage. Does that make one employee better than the other or not? So we're here with Steve. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Drew. So happy to be here. Awesome. Hey, could you take a minute, maybe just introduce yourself? Tell us how you ended up at such a cool place like King's Crowd. Absolutely. I am the CTO over at King's Crowd, and we provide ratings and analytics to startup investors, particularly in the retail space, which is a new space that historically retail investors have not been able to be a part of. Awesome. Can you explain a little bit? I'm really fascinated by what King's Crowd is doing and what it's opening up in, in this space. What does it do for investors? Absolutely. Historically, investors have been unable to invest in startups unless they were accredited, high net worth, or venture capital. And changes in the Jobs Act has allowed for anyone to invest in a startup or any founder to raise capital from anyone. That's great. The trouble, of course, is that there are thousands now doing this. So if you are an investor, where do you begin? Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? Is this a good price or a bad price? When will I see a return? Maybe not. So what we do is we come in and we analyze all of the companies that are out in the market right now. And we provide reports and data and ratings to those investors to help them build the best portfolio they can. And then ultimately, we keep them up to date on changes to the companies as those companies grow. Great. So as you mentioned, being able to help people understand good price, bad price, that gets to like valuation of startups. Now, we know investors, especially VCs, yes, there's the idea. But ultimately, we're investing in the, the founders, those behind that idea. That can be super hard sometime, right, to understand what is the value of this, which is why VC has this like this risk taking persona. So with what you're doing at King's Crowd, can you share like, how do you approach that thought? That's why it's been so hard. Like, how can you reduce those barriers? To valuation? It's a great question. Valuation is an interesting point and it's something that we look at very seriously because oftentimes a founder is going to self-evaluate and it might be right, might be wrong. And of course, there's the quantitative side of things. And that's something that we can look at and approach the addressable audience or the market. We can note what they have in cash on hand or what their current burn rates are. What you touched on there with founders is interesting because that's the other half of the equation. You're, at this point, you're investing in a startup so early on that you're investing in the person just as much as you're investing in the company, investing in the idea, as you said. So with this, what we often try to do is meet with the founders and getting an understanding of where they see things going and the likelihood that they're going to be successful. So qualitative versus quantitative, right? Correct. Maybe take us on the journey and educate us a little bit because some of our listeners may not may not understand it. When speaking purely on the quantitative side, what sorts of factors do you look at when evaluating a startup? That's great. Yeah, we break our work from a tracking perspective down into several major categories. Uh, quantitatively, we generally look at the SEC filings information we can find on their uh, raise page from their financials perspective and things of that nature. We will track all of that. But separately, we'll go through any media press video work that they have. And that shifts us into looking more at the team and more at the founder. That's when we'll look at, of course, LinkedIn. What are they writing about themselves on their website, their past experiences, things of that nature. And we'll look at the overall market, the performance of that market, the potential of that market. 
And how do they differentiate in that? What do their competitors look like? And where do they stand out? And where don't they? Taking this to, if we were thinking about this and we're like, all right, so we have somebody in a startup, we have a founding team, we have a market segment that's maybe ripe for disruption, ripe for innovation, right? We're, as you said, we're looking at factors, whether that's about the individual that we can assess from the interwebs and other places. We're looking at SEC filings, we're, right? We're even interviewing the team, if we were to take this whole experience, right, and it, it makes me think about how this work that King's Crowd is doing, could it actually influence how businesses think about just calculating, you know, the value of teams inside businesses, never, never mind startups, but the business community at large, our ability to predict performance is extremely under sophisticated. And so it almost sounds like the level of sophistication you have like businesses actually don't have a lot of that to predict success of teams internally. Do you think that the work you're doing could ever advance that inside companies? It's, it's a very interesting thought. The idea that the startup is not simply the idea of a new business launching, but potentially a department within a company. It's a great idea. The concept there would, of course, require all of the information that a company, as if they were an autonomous company, the same through leadership and founding, the same quantitative information in terms of their financials yeah. and what their burn rates are against their departmental budgets. I love what you even just saying, right? It requires data. Absolutely. And we lack that data internally, which is, I think one of the, we talk about this on the show. It's one of the things that the hope is that technological innovation, even concepts like Web3, will open the door to portability of that data, standardization of that data, the ability for individuals to own that data, and therefore create an imperative inside businesses to provide that data and measure it. Just thinking down this vein about like ideation, you have a storied career as a CTO, right? And now you're at King's Crowd doing this work and analysis in the startup space. How has the work that you've done there to date influenced how you think about the market at large, how you think about this space, how you think about career development? My, You've touched on my background and how I've been through many different companies, through manufacturing, into running my own startups, through consulting, and then advertising, and in which case, working with Fortune 500 banks and insurance companies and e-commerce shops and all across the board. My biggest surprise is in seeing how many people want to invest in these small startups. What's even more interesting than that is oftentimes they're only investing in one startup. They're really investing in the people and the networks around them. And going back to that earlier point that they're investing in the person itself. We often mm -hmm. think about startup investing as bigger venture capital, millions of dollars to build these great massive businesses. But oftentimes these founders are just looking for enough to get their idea long before they can even get to that stage. Shifting gears a little bit, the employee-employer relationship is broken. How do you respond to that statement and what do you attribute to your beliefs? I believe that the employee-employer relationship has always been broken. It's always been a bit of a power struggle. The employer wants employees there for a certain block of time to do a certain thing and output a certain thing. And the employee is pushing back and saying, I'm going to do that, then I need more money, or I need more resources, or I need more time. It's always constantly that back and forth between those two things. The change, though, has moved towards as Technology has entered the world, it empowered the employee to see what's beyond their own walls, to create things that either are in their business that can help the business in a way that their job role didn't require, or potentially allow them to enter something completely different with the lower effort. Are you seeing that materialize in some of the work, whether it's the startups or the industry sectors that you're exposed to in King's Crowd? When a founder goes out to market looking for investment, they're inherently asking for the community to get involved. At that point, they have very few employees, generally speaking. We'll say less than 10 at this point. Mm -hmm. So not the big corporate conglomerates that are out there. But what we see from the investor side is that there's a desire to want to be part of it, to be part of something bigger without the constraints defined by, say, a centralized entity within a corporation as an employer 
our employee may ultimately end up finding themselves in. So to me, when I look at the investments flowing into these companies, it comes down to just that. It's being a part of something bigger. And I think that translates just as much to the employee at, at a larger company as it does for the smaller ones. Absolutely. Taking one step even closer in proximity to your specialty, right? Chief technology officer, creating applications, working with engineers, talk about a space that is just ripe with AI, automation, work. I imagine you must run into the conversation from time and time again about, we, we talk about this on the show here, AI, robots, automation, are they replacing us or are they freeing us up to do more meaningful work? What do you make of this from your vantage point in business? I believe that everybody, they're going to define what meaningful work looks like to themselves. Some have focused their life in other areas beyond work and meaningful means I get a paycheck. There are other individuals who have focused their life on their work and meaningful is something going beyond that. And out of that technology offers, and in both instances, I would say the risk reward. Some people don't want it because it just breaks the thing that's already working for them. And some people say, I can do more because of it. And that goes to both sides of that example there. What I found over the years is that there's too much technology out there for any one person to learn it. You have to a certain point allow for others to find, experiment, start to incorporate and see what comes out of that. But especially when it comes to engineers, giving the freedom so that they can explore those new technologies, come up with new ideas, find new solutions. Sometimes it's something that's just stuck in their head. And sometimes it's something to a bigger business problem. Specifically when it comes to the latest advancements in artificial intelligence, there was a a report by the World Economic Forum published a few weeks ago saying that they expect that the introduction of AI and speaking about chat GPT hitting the market and all the fervor about it, that it'll probably displace about 80 million jobs. On the flip side, they estimate early indicators that it'll create probably like 90 million jobs. And, we, and I think it'll probably be over 100 million. And that's opening the door to jobs like query engineer and things of that nature. Are you thinking about how AI, it, it already has, but I'd love for you to maybe talk about it a bit on how AI has actually impacted the role of engineering. Before we get into either the, how AI now is impacting, I think it's important to think about the long tail of how technology, and, and I can only go back as far as I know, yeah. historically, you could go back yeah. probably to the beginning of time and show how technology continues to displace or replace or augment, how, however you want to think about it, the job and the job title changes, of course. Oftentimes, I it, it, through history, you would note that the jobs necessarily the, it doesn't replace the human, it replaces the job function that the human was doing prior to that. From my own experience over the last 20 to 25 years in this space, my first title was webmaster. And what I've found over the years is that the titles become more and more both specific and forked and that a webmaster was someone who did everything there possibly was to do on the web, everything from analytics through building the website, designing the website, building the databases, hosting everything, handling social media accounts, so on and so forth. Now, of course, all of those have split off into completely different realms. And where ultimately AI comes in, it's, it's another layer on top of all of that. AI is freeing up engineers to determine what they're going to do. I wish I could say that there's one clear answer. Yeah. I go back to what I said earlier, where it's how the person defines meaningful work that ultimately is the outcome. If, say, you don't have to spend hours of your day doing what you were doing, then comes the question of what do you do at that time? For yeah. some people, it will say, I can now get paid the same amount of money for a whole lot less time. So I'm going to spend that time traveling the world or spending more time with my family. For others, it might say, I'm going to go build something else. And ultimately, that'll come down to the individual. So while AI has such an impact in technology right now, it's providing more of just a freedom for the employee to decide what you do with that. Sure. I love what you just said about freedom. We're seeing so much over the last decade no longer I, do I think people are graduating from school and entering the working world thinking, I'm going to spend 35 years at Acme Solutions. It's just not going to happen. There's this notion now of freedom, of flexibility that's introduced, perhaps has swung a little too far on the fractional and gig work. 
meaning like there's a huge push for it. Like it's going to be the be all end all. Maybe it is. But what do you make of this shift to fractional or gig work? And what does that say about somebody's commitment or dedication to one company? When we look at fractional work, I think it's important that we also compare that or look at that in the same conversation to freelance consulting work, part-time labor brought in. And I see the freelance part-time labor as putting the control back in the employer. They've decided that these are the amount of hours you're going to work for me, but it doesn't really shift the narrative. Full-time work was 40 hours, part-time work is 20 hours, but it's defined by the employer. You start to look at fractional, starts to move the conversation more towards the employee. And the employee is saying, Mm -hmm. I'm dedicated to you. However, I'm not dedicated to you 100% of the time. Now, myself coming from an advertising consulting background, that's how we've always operated. And we would be managing 10 different clients and shifting between those. And interestingly, it creates this divergent thought pattern that brings new ideas into spaces that you never would have had before. To me, fractional is actually a positive. Furthermore, it allows the employee to decide what is the right amount of work for me, whereas full-time work was predefined by an employer and you can either take it or you can leave it. And I love what you just said, right? Fractional gives more leverage to the employee. Do you think it's possible to build a company 100% on fractional or freelance resources? Can a company be built on fractional alone? No. However, I do believe that fractional from the start will organically move to a place where someone is spending certainly more than half, if not 100% of their time on one company because they're passionate about it. And then ultimately you're back to a 100% model. But hopefully that doesn't lose the aspect of fractional for those who aren't at that place in their life. Yeah. And this is the paradox or the conundrum. Taking this one step further, Upwork, right? The biggest name in freelance and fractional work just announced that you can now engage workers full-time on their platform. So the only difference then is the contract, right? We're also seeing in the news, the rising trend of more union activity amongst workforces. And it just makes me wonder this whole notion of at will employment, it's creating some friction, right? What do you make of that? When you see the future, do you think we'll be much more contractual in our engagements? Or do you think at will still very much will prevail? Any type of work between two individuals, there has to be some level of a contract. Sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal. The expectation that I've asked you for something and you're going to, you will deliver on that. Historically, I feel we've often transacted on time alone instead of value output. What I hope is that in the future, we'll see more of this without the constraints around the time. Tell me more about this notion of time as the value output. Time to me is another control mechanism. How many widgets can you pump out in an hour? You can start Mm. to slice and dice that and determine that the average employee can pump out X amount of widgets. Everybody's held to that certain benchmark and then will they exceed or under exceed? And then you can write performance management against that. Technology has allowed, afforded individuals to create 10X the amount of widgets in the same amount of time. And those tools are evenly distributed, but some will take advantage, some will not take advantage. Does that make one employee better than the other or not? It's, It's an interesting question. Aside from time, are there are there any other attributes that come to mind on how we should look at that? I believe there's plenty and it'll vary plenty of attributes that an employer should be looking at, but it's going to depend on the employer in their own given situation. Ultimately, even time though, leave ladders up to something bigger, which is ultimately employee, employer trust. Whether you put constraint on time or you put constraint on locale, being in the office or being out of the office working for us alone or working for somebody else. It all comes down to, do you trust that this individual will deliver on what is needed? And so those attributes could be all of those, all of the above. Love that notion of trust. We were just speaking with an economist yesterday, a a labor economist, and we were talking about roles in STEM. So engineering being those. And how there's essentially a call to arms, if you will, for more soft skills, human skills across all areas of business. Can you speak to us a little bit specifically how that's evolving in terms of web development, engineering, and pro- programming? When you think about so- soft skills, are you just looking at that at a leadership level now or those skills that are that should be ubiquitous and applied across all levels? I do believe that soft skills need to be applied across all levels. Soft skills are going to vary based on the needs of the company and what ultimately they want to accomplish. However, 
if you were to take to the extreme of somebody who is given a request and they handle the inputs and give you an output, you're not getting to the bigger problem or bigger question that the company is trying to solve for or have answered. And soft skills, the communication aspects of it, they're looking a little bit deeper, reading between the lines, seeing an opportunity beyond what they're simply working on. Those are the things that are critically important. I think if you build a culture of individuals who are only going to do the former, you run into a challenge of only one or two people in the company trying to make the decisions for everybody. And then inherently, you're going to see pushback. Do you think if you were to rewind back to where you started your career, and then you look today, do you think that those soft skills are equally coveted, less coveted, more coveted today? I believe the soft skills are equally coveted. However, I don't, I, I've still even to date have never seen a, a resume that really has done a great or a job description that's done yeah. a great job of identifying what that is or what that means. Interesting. If you had to dream that up, like when you say that, like a job description, like what would it be asking for? What the job description is going to ask for is going to vary across, right? But ultimately it comes down to solving problems. But that, that it's too big of an idea to put into any one job description. Yeah. And it's going to vary between. And you know it when you work with an employee, coworker who's really good. So he or she is coming up with new ideas and, and really adding to the conversation. You want those folks. And we oftentimes look to how do you retain mm -hmm. those folks? It's difficult to hire for it because you can't get that simply from an interview. I know we're over time, but could I ask you a couple more questions? Yeah, absolutely. When you, let's say that you were looking for an engineer off the street to work with you on your team at King's Crab, what would you be looking for as far as aptitudes from that individual and what sorts of soft skills, if you could explain it, and then tell me a little bit about some of the top hard skills you typically are looking for in engineers. Hard skills in an engineer is going to be the probably the cliche. We have a set of technologies that have been chosen and therefore likely need to have some background in that or at least an interest uh, mm -hmm. shown through the work that you've done in coding in that language or just coding simply. But I think that is superseded by- sure. The soft skill, which to me, the most important one is critical thinking and curiosity. Mm. The ability to look at something and question it and then be curious enough to go after the answer. Honestly, you get those two things. It doesn't matter what the hard skills are. If you want it bad enough, you're going to go out and teach yourself or you're going to go out and figure it out. Those are the two qualities to me that when it comes to business, I personally look for because I know that those are individuals who are driven by something bigger than just what they code and what they put into the work that they're doing. I look at like the field of engineering and from a assessment standpoint, I think that engineering, because there's so much you can analyze in how did you solve this problem, right? Did you write a thousand lines of code? Did you write one line of code, right? There are ways for us to test that hard skill, I think, in, in a lot of ways. And therefore, if you can test it, you can benchmark it, and then maybe you can give add-on career development services or education to said individual to help them. How do you think about it on the soft skill side? Do you feel like you have a way of assessing that ability? Is it more so observed? And then when you do identify that development is needed, is that something that you look at as equally, you could invest in that and you can get an equal amount of return as you could for developing on the hard skill side? When you talk about engineering and that it's very measurable, it is, but sometimes that is lost on the fact that the measurement requires something we're measuring against. Mm. has to be a goal or an objective given to that writing of that code. Great. You could be a great coder. You could also be a really fast typer. It doesn't make you an author. Oftentimes it's seeing something bigger in it and coming up with the solutions that someone else might not see. Now, at a very basic level, when someone is unable to think at that level, let me think bigger than what you just told me code for, you now have a duplicative workforce. Or at the very least, you have to have two people, one person who's writing the spec and another person who's writing the code against the spec. And right mm -hmm. there, you run into a challenge of just resources and resourcing alone. You have individuals who are given a bigger problem to solve, and they're going to find the tools, whatever they are, be that writing your own code, APIs and services that might be out there, chat GPT, yep. all of that, right? You're, that's at that point that someone can solve for the bigger problem, regardless of what it took. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that you see like the more strategic or relational roles versus the more tactical objective roles, right? Exactly. Shifting gears, most 
all career development services today are subsidized by the employer. The whole market categories around that, not the employee. The employees are rarely subsidizing their own journey. It's viewed as a perk, I think, in a lot of work contexts. In that way, the business is always the primary beneficiary. So if you have an engineer and you need a certain thing done, certain thing code, you're going to be like, cool, I'll put you through school to do that. But even if their passion, their talent, their aptitude would lean in another direction, the business, it, it could potentially pigeonhole someone for their career. And so this movement to freedom of work, fractional work, gig work, I think is opening up this door to my career, my development. Do you see a world where we would see more career development services catering directly to the employee? I hope we do see a world with more career development catering to the employee outside of the employer alone for absolutely, because oftentimes those things are going to come with certain stipulations, paying for college courses, but not no, no reimbursement unless they remain for X amount of years. And I don't necessarily, the employer has to see a return at some point because they are invested. But to me, it's interesting that we look at it as whether the employer is investing, then there's no other opportunity. Hmm. There is opportunity outside of your employer to find that. And it could be investing in yourself. It could be simply, how do I spend my time in a fractional economy? Maybe you say, I'm going to work 30 hours full time, and then I'm going to spend the remainder of my days working through online classes or going to hmm. school. And you're investing in yourself. You could be spending that time making money, but you're investing in your yourself. You originally go off to college or even in your high school and middle school years, that's your family is oftentimes or you're investing in yourself there in the time and the, sometimes the money that actually goes into that. In the Kings Crowd world, what we're seeing is that the investors are looking at very much the company and the potential of the company. They are looking at the founders too. And in many ways, that's exactly what they're doing. It's outside resources saying, how can we invest in you? I personally hope that we'll start to see a world where there's the opportunity for others to invest in the individual. So that maybe in those off hours in a fractional universe, you could be making or be supported financially with the bigger gain for yourself and, and for those who have helped you along the way. I love that notion. I love what you just too said as well as there, when investors are looking in the company, they're looking at how can we deploy these resources to make this team successful? So I think that that's a really great way to look at it. Steve, thanks so much for your time today. Is is there anything else that you want to share with the audience or anything we didn't talk about today that you'd like to cover? No, this was great. Thanks so much for having me on. We're delighted to have you. Thanks, Steve.